Welcome guys to today's presentation where we're going to look at the general resuscitation of the patient uh, with emergency surgery. For example, if the patient has come to you with septic arthritis, the patient is having uh, intestinal obstruction, what should we consider? How are we going to resuscitate that patient so that we preserve the life of that patient? So today we are saying that we are going to look at the general resuscitation of the patient. So when you look at the general resuscitation uh, of the patient, you know that the first thing that we're going to have are the ends. Okay, we need first to come up with the ends. Okay. What is our objective? Okay. So on the ends, the ends they're simply asking you to say what is our objective? What do you want to achieve? Okay, this patient of course has come with septic arthritis. The patient has come with intestinal obstruction. What is our objective? What do you want to achieve? Okay, so the first thing that we're going to achieve, we want to resuscitate, okay? So one aim is to resuscitate, okay? To resuscitate the patient, okay? That is one of the aim that we want to achieve. We want to resuscitate this patient so that this patient continues to live his or a normal life, okay? Because if we're not going to resuscitate this patient, he or she might die. Then what else? To prevent complications okay to prevent complications what can some of the complications that the patient might have eg shock hemorrhage okay etc so we want to prevent complications from occurring because you know that if the patient has or develops some complication then it will be very difficult for us to manage this patient because we're going to be managing the condition as well as the complication so we don't want the patient to have some complications okay then after we have written our aims okay there are so many aims that we can talk about but just for now let's just consider having two aims so after we have written the aims what else are we going to talk about of course, you know that after the ends, we will talk about the primary assessment and resuscitation. Okay, we need to assess the general condition of the patient. Okay, we need to assess if the patient, if the patient's airway is patent, if the patient's, uh, if the patient's circulation is okay. Okay, so after the ends, we're talking about the primary assessment and resuscitation okay so under primary assessment and resuscitation is that what are we talking about so under this these are the things that we're going to do okay we need first to assess the patient because sometimes the patient might come uh, with um, intestinal obstruction or maybe septic arthritis and the patient is just walking okay the patient is not having difficulties with breathing. The patient is not having difficulties with uh, circulation. The circulation is just okay. The air is just okay. Are you going to look after that? No, you won't. You're not going to look after that. Not so. Okay. So what if the patient comes in an unconscious state? What if the patient comes with, uh, with maybe problem with breathing, problem with uh, uh, the circulation? Okay. What are we going to do? What are things that we need to consider? So the first thing is that we need to assess. We assess the general condition, the, the general condition of the patient, as well as if the airway is patent, the breathing is patent, and the circulation. Okay. So after writing this, we need to check if the airway. Okay. We look at we look at the airway of the patient. Okay. So now, when you look, this is under primary assessment. So when looking at the airway of the patient, what are we supposed to consider? We need to assess if the patient's airway is patent or not. Okay? How are you going to know that the airway is patent or not? If the patient is breathing normally, the patient is not having any strider, the patient is not having any wheezing, of course you're going to know that the, patient, the patient's airway is patent. Okay? So what else are you going to consider? You need to check under the airway, you need to check if the patient has secretions. Okay? So check for secretions. Why are you checking for secretions? Because you know that secretions 
are one of the things that can actually block the patient's airway, especially if the patient is unconscious. Okay, so you need to check for secretion. And if the patient has secretion, please make sure that you suck the secretion out uh, using that working suction machine or you tilt the patient's head and extend the neck to allow drainage of secretion. Why are you doing that intervention? Because you don't want the patient to aspirate those secretion. Because if the patient aspirate those secretion, the patient is going to have aspiration pneumonia. So what are we saying? Make sure that under air where you check for secretion. And if the patient has secretion, please suck those secretion with the working suction machine. Okay, so that the patient's airway is patent. Okay, and you tilt the patient's head and extend the neck in order to allow drainage of secretion. The reason why you're doing that intervention is that you don't want the patient to aspirate. Okay, you don't want the patient to aspirate. Okay, you don't want the patient to aspirate. This is what you don't want. Okay, you don't want the patient to aspirate this. Okay, you are preventing aspiration. If the patient aspirates, then the patient is going to have uh, aspiration pneumonia. Okay, so that's one thing you consider under airway. What else are you going to look for? What else? What are the other things that can actually uh, interfere with the patient's airway? We are talking about uh, foreign bodies. Okay, foreign bodies. Uh, let's say e.g. dentures Okay, dentures you know that the dentures or the other foreign bodies this can actually fall in the patient's airway and occlude the patient's airway if the patient if the patient has got dentures uh, or other foreign bodies and the patient is unconscious you know that these can actually fall in the patient's airway and occlude the airway and the patient will find it so difficult to breathe, okay? So if the patient has this, please use an artery forcep so that you remove these dentures in order, why are you removing this? Because you don't want this to occlude the patient's airway, okay? You use an artery forcep to remove these dentures. The reason why you're doing this intervention is that you don't want these dentures to occlude the patient's airway because if that patient's airway becomes occluded the patient will have respiratory acidosis meaning that there will be more carbon dioxide that's actually going to accumulate in the air sac okay what else do you have to consider on the airway okay you also have to consider checking okay the tongue okay you need to consider checking the tongue let's use in brack you need to consider checking the tongue, okay? The tongue of the patient. Has the, pa has the patient's tongue fallen back, okay? Because you know that if the tongue has rolled back, okay? If the tongue has rolled back, the tongue can block and interfere with the patient's airway, okay? If the tongue has rolled back, please, this tongue, it's a muscle, okay? You know that for a muscle to actually move, it needs a movement, okay? So you make sure that if the tongue has rolled back, you can tilt the patient's head, okay? Like tilt like this. You can tilt the patient's head and extend the neck so that the tongue uh, does not interfere with the patient's airway. So these are some of the things that you have actually have to consider when you are assessing for the patient's airway. What about, what else do we have to consider during the primary assessment and resuscitation? Breathing. Okay. Breathing. So, under breathing. So, this is point number two. Under breathing, what are you going to consider? Okay. So, under breathing, make sure that you assess if the patient's breathing patency is okay or not. And how are you going to tell that the patient's breathing patency uh, it's okay or not you are going to count the rise and falling of the chest okay so um, counting rise 
and falling of chest okay so this one counting the rise and falling of the chest it's going to detect whether the patient has tachypnea or bradypnea so this one is actually going to tell you if the patient has tachypnea or bradypnea or bradyphonia depending on how you call it okay so you consider you have to check you count the rise and falling of the chest and you know that the normal respiration actually it varies maybe uh you find that some books will tell you to say 16 to 20 others will tell you 12 to 20 okay so you count the rise and falling of the chest and if you find that the patient has tachypnea this it simply means that the patient is having a rapid respiration and this bradyphonia simply means that the patient is having a low respiration and uh, if the patient has tachypnea okay if the patient has tachypnea please consider maybe positioning the patient in semi flawless so that you allow full lung expansion okay you allow full lung expansion what else do you have to check for under breathing you need to place the back of your palm okay place the back of your palm back of the palm is just the back of the palm on patient's nostrils okay you need to place the back of your palm on the patient's nostrils to feel for warmth air okay the reason why you are placing this back of your palm you want to feel that warm air and if that warm air is not coming out from the patient, it simply means that the patient is having difficulties with what? Respiration. But if that warm air is coming out, of course it will tell you to say that the patient is breathing normally. Okay? And the patient is breathing. And if the patient has or that warm air is not coming out, you can consider doing the cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Okay? Then from here, what else do you consider under breathing? You need to check for oxygen saturation okay so you need to check for oxygen saturation okay check for oxygen saturation what do you what do we use for checking for oxygen saturation we use the pulse oximeter okay so check for oxygen saturation using a pulse oximeter and if the saturations are below 90 percent consider giving the patient oxygen therapy which is about uh, four to six liters per minute because why are you why are you giving this patient oxygen because you want to prevent respiratory acidosis okay as well as you want to actually allow oxygen tissue perfusion you want oxygen to reach the tissues so from the breathing we're now going to talk about the circulation so i will need to wrap this so that we write the circulation of the patient so looking at the circulation okay looking at the circulation of the patient okay we are from talking about the uh, the breathing what about the circulation what do you have to consider when you're checking the patient circulation you need to actually check what do we consider in the circulation we consider the pulse okay we consider the pulse so you need to check the patient's pulse okay check the patient's pulse is the patient having tachycardia okay is the patient having tachycardia is the patient having bradycardia you know that the normal pulse is between uh, 60 beats per minute to 90 beats per minute okay so you need to consider checking the pulse and if the patient is having tachycardia it might indicate that the patient is undergoing into shock or maybe the patient is bleeding somewhere and the heart is trying to compensate for the reduced oxygen okay so you have to give fluid okay so what is the intervention that you are going to give if the patient has tachycardia consider giving what fluid okay you don't know this patient is unconscious okay so consider giving fluid and this amount of fluid that you are going to give you will give alternating fluid 
okay alternating out fluid alternating so that is one liter of ringers okay ringers lactate ringers lactate okay one liter normal saline okay and one liter dextrose saline okay why are you giving this why are you giving this fluid the reason why you are giving this fluid is that uh, you are giving dextrose because you don't know the blood sugar of the patient what if you don't have the glucometer to check the uh, the glucose level the blood sugar level of the patient so you need to give dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia because this patient is unconscious you don't know if the patient if the patient has eaten or not Okay, so you consider as well giving dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. You also check for the patient's what? Blood pressure. Okay. Um, blood pressure. What if the patient has uh, hypotension? Okay, if maybe the patient is bleeding, hypotension or hypertension. What are you going to do in this case? So in this case, you know, you know that the normal blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure, the normal, it's actually from, in other books, you find that's from 100 to 140 uh, minimal per mercury. In others, you find that the diastolic is, uh, uh, it will tell you to say from 60 to 90, okay? But the average uh, for systolic it's about 120, okay? The average blood pressure for the systolic is about 120 uh, minimal per mercury, okay? So now when you look at the blood pressure of the patient, when you check the patient's blood pressure, if the patient maybe, for example, was involved in a road traffic accident, you know that the patient actually lost his or her blood and the patient is going to be in hypotension. The patient is going to have hypotension. What are you going to do? What intervention are you going to do? Consider giving normal saline. Okay, why are you going to give normal saline? Okay, you give normal saline, which is 3 liters. Okay, 3 liters in 24 hours. Okay, why are you giving normal saline? Remember that normal saline, it has the normal concentration as with blood. Okay, and these are plasma expanders. Plasma expander. So you give normal saline, which is a plasma expander. Okay. What if the patient has hypertension? What if the patient has hypertension? What are you going to do? In this case, if the patient is conscious, please allow the patient. Do not give any fluid. Okay. Do not give fluid. Okay. Do not give IV fluid. Okay? Do not give IV fluid. Why are you not giving IV fluid? Because when you give IV fluid, you are going to increase the blood volume of the patient. And when you increase the blood volume of the patient, the patient may actually go into cerebrovascular accident. The patient can have CVA, which is cerebrovascular accident. So you do not want to give the patient CVA. Okay. So in this case, if the patient is conscious, please advise the patient to drink oral. Okay. To drink water, or you can give oral water. Okay. Allow uh, the patient to be actually having uh, to be drinking water rather, and you can also give diuretics. Okay. Diuretics, uh, diuresis drugs uh, such as Lasix so that the patient can actually uh, have more diuresis and the pa when the patient is having more diuresis you know that the patient will be urinating okay as a result of that that blood actually the volume of blood is going to decrease what else do you consider so these are the things that we consider under circulation but we also consider the other thing which we are which we are saying as uh, you check for capillary refill Okay, check for capillary refill. When you place the nail bed, okay, when you compress the nail bed and you find that it's returning very slowly, you will actually know that, 
the patient is actually having what there is reduced blood volume to this to the peripherals okay so you consider checking the capillary fee. you can also check about for sino you can also check cyanosis okay check the extremities are they pale or are they blue okay then what else so this is what you you initially the few points that you consider when you're checking for the patient circulation okay but there are so many then what else do you consider under primary assessment you have to consider checking d and d simply means disability okay disability or drugs okay disability or drugs in some cases you find that you have to give drugs to this patient because if you're not going to give drugs this patient is going to die even if you have done this the a the b the c but if you haven't given the drugs the patient is going to die so there are some conditions where you have to give the drugs in this case but there are also some condition where d it simply means disability okay d it simply means disability where you do a quick uh, physical examination why are you doing a physical examination you want to check if the patient is the patient uh, having any fractures okay has the patient uh, sustained a fracture so you check for fractures in disability okay in under d it simply means drugs you are going to give drugs to this patient because you know that if you're not going to give drugs this patient is going to die so Thank you so much uh, for taking your time to watch this uh, general assessment of the general resuscitation of the patient where we looked at the primary assessment and resuscitation. But please, we are going next time we'll talk about the, the general resuscitation that is actually done in a medical emergency. Thank you very much. So, but before we go into, uh, before we, we close our presentation, let's first consider talking about as well as the secondary assessment, okay? Let's also look at the secondary assessment, because if we do the primary assessment, then we also have to talk about the secondary assessment. But you wanted to talk about it in the next lecture. So, looking at the secondary assessment, in the secondary assessment, what are you going to consider? You have already resuscitated the patient. So, under secondary assessment, what are you looking for? So under secondary assessment is that you have to do some investigation, okay? Make sure that you collect some, you, you carry out some investigations. Uh, what are some of the investigations that you have to do? So you need to collect the patient's blood, okay? Some lab, uh, lab investigation. Collect the patient's blood for full blood count. Why are you collecting the patient's blood for full blood count? You are collecting this blood and you are taken to the lab to check for hemoglobin levels okay you are collecting this blood because you want to check for hb levels okay hb levels which are hemoglobin levels that's the reason why you are collecting the patient's blood for full blood count then you have to consider collecting as well the patient's blood for grouping okay and cross match which is actually abbreviated as X match. Okay, so when you collect the patient's blood for grouping and cross match, this one, because why are you collecting this? You want to check for the patient's blood group. Okay, you are checking for the patient's blood group. You don't want to give uh, or to infuse the wrong blood, the long, uh, you don't want to infuse the different blood group of the patient. Okay. Then you also have to do some x-rays, depending whether it's a limb or chest, you have to do some x-ray, okay, which is going to show you the diagnosis. You also can do the CT scan, okay, you can also do the ultrasound scan. Now, we forgot, you also can do uh, the history taking, okay, you collect the history. History is very much vital. Okay, in fact, this one is the first one that you actually do. You do the history taking and you also have to consider doing the physical examination. Okay? Physical examination. So, this is what you're actually going to consider when you're doing the secondary assessment of a surgical
uh, emergence in the patient you collect you do the investigation then under the investigation <coughs> make sure that you actually collect the patient's history you do the physical examination you collect the patient's blood and take to the lab for full blood count uh, for uh, for hemoglobin levels you also collect the patient's blood and take to the lab for grouping and cross match because you don't want to infuse the different blood group in the patient you also consider check doing the x-ray if it's if the patient maybe has a flare chest multiple lip fractures you can do a chest x-ray okay you can also do a ct scan ultrasound scan uh, so these are some of the things that you consider under the secondary assessment so thank you so much so if you haven't yet subscribed again please subscribe so that you can receive notification